we should be here momentarily. We're going to get this party started. I want to admit, wait you guys to make you wait too long. We're going to be talking about carpal tunnel today and some of the novel approaches that we have here at Regenix at New Regeneration Orthopedics of Florida. And Dr. Pappas is going to lead us out. Take, take the wheel, Dr. Pappas. Hey, everybody. Um, so let's um, talk a little bit about carpal tunnel syndrome. We're going to start off with, you know, what it is, how to diagnose it, um, and then take us through some of the, the treatment options uh, and some of the nuances of it. Um, so let's get started. Uh, Dr. T, can you go to the next slide? So at, at uh, New Regeneration Orthopedics, Regenix Tampa Bay, et cetera, we're, <clears throat> Dr. T and I are, are two of uh, four physicians. Um, actually, we just added a fifth uh, to our Orlando location. Um, I'm mainly in our Tampa office. Dr. T is mainly in Sarasota uh, and St. Petersburg. Uh, Dr. Lever is in Sarasota primarily, and Dr. Belastro is in Tampa and St. Pete. Uh, and then all of us rotate uh, through Orlando uh, office as well. Uh, and then we just hired a new physician for Orlando office named Dr. Lee. Um, next slide. Uh, and so just what we normally do are, are high level interventional procedures for uh, non-surgical orthopedics using patients own uh, cells often cases, things like platelets, things like bone marrow derived stem cells uh, in order to treat um, uh, different orthopedic conditions and pain. Um, and so today we're going to talk specifically a little bit more about carpal tunnel syndrome. So let's go to the next slide um, and keep going. And so what, you know, how common is uh, carpal tunnel syndrome? About one in 10 people um, maybe slightly more common than this, will get carpal tunnel syndrome at some point in their lifetimes. It's most commonly diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 60. I've seen it as young as, as you know, uh, late teenagers. I've seen it as old as people in their 90s. Um, you know, so it does, it does affect uh, people across a, a wide range of ages. Women are three times more likely to, to get it than men, although we see plenty of men with it as well. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Um, so what happens when you have carpal tunnel syndrome? So what people will say is, I've got numbness and tingling either in the palm, the wrist, and especially up and through the thumb, the index, middle finger, sometimes into the ring finger as well. Um, usually um, they feel you know pins and needles. Oftentimes this affects uh, them at night. They'll wake up at night, start flicking their wrist called the flick sign. Uh, that's very classic for carpal tunnel syndrome. Eventually, it can lead to weak grip strength, difficulty doing things that require dexterity with the hands. Sometimes the pain can travel up the arm towards the shoulder or the forearm. Um, these are all kind of the classic symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, <clears throat> what are some risk factors for carpal tunnel? Uh, Extensive repetitive movements, especially if you're, you know, holding something that vibrates like a jackhammer or something like that. Um, pregnancy increases your risk. Arthritis in some of the thumb, in the thumb and the wrist joints increases your risk. And then certain systemic conditions like hypothyroidism, diabetes, trauma to the area. Those are all things that can increase your risk for carpal tunnel. Although we see plenty of people that have no risk factors necessarily for carpal tunnel, but they still have this because it is, it is quite common. Next slide. Um, and so what is happening when somebody has these symptoms? Well, the carpal tunnel is basically a choke point in the wrist uh, created by uh, bones of the wrist and also a, a ligament at the top that creates the roof of the carpal tunnel. And at this choke point, you have nine different tendons that are passing through as well as a nerve called the median nerve. And so over time, the, the ligament on top can get thickened and so can the uh, tendons that pass through. And so the odd man out there is the nerve. And when the tendons get thicker, when the ligament gets thicker, then the nerve can become compressed and we can have um, uh, those sensations that we just described, the numbness, the tingling, eventually uh, weakness uh, in pain. <clears throat> Next slide. So uh, the big concern with carpal tunnel is if we, if we leave it untreated for long enough, it can progress 
into permanent weakness. Um, you can see here that this person has atrophy of uh, uh, several muscles in their hand uh, called the uh, called the APB muscles. Um, basically, these are muscles that control uh, the thumb. And in this person's case, you know, they had carpal tunnel syndrome. They left it too long and it led to permanent weakness. And so that's what we want to avoid. Next slide. Um, so how do we diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, there are um, uh, evidence-based questionnaires out there. You know, with carpal tunnel syndrome, it's relatively easy. If it walks like carpal tunnel syndrome, sounds like carpal tunnel syndrome, it usually is carpal tunnel syndrome. And so you just fill out a questionnaire and if you score a certain number on it, uh, it's it's quite likely that you have it. There are a couple of physical exam that maneuvers that we can do to kind of compress the median nerve and see if that reproduces your symptoms. Uh, but uh, uh, as well as the history and physical exam, there's a couple of objective tests as well in the next slide. So uh, probably the most common objective test performed for this is something called an EMG, a nerve conduction study. Basically, you put some electrodes on the person's arm and you can send electric shocks up the uh, various nerves in the arm and hand in order to assess how fast they're firing. Um, the annoying part about this test, I've done hundreds of these, it's it's unpleasant for the patient um, and it is more expensive and it's a bit time consuming. It takes, a, um, you know, usually 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how extensive the exam is to, to perform. Uh, much more preferable, I find, is just throwing the ultrasound on there taking a look at how big the carpal tunnel is at, at the area where it enters under that ligament. If it's fat and swollen at that area, and there's some objective ways to measure that, and then we know that the person has carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, that takes about one minute uh, and is is uh, not painful at all for the patient. So I uh, prefer diagnosing it through the ultrasound. Next slide. So, and then... I was going to, um, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to let Dr. T jump in and talk about some of the, the treatments. So yeah, some of the non-surgical options that we have, the most frequent things that people try are night splints, some splinting, some anti-inflammatories. These are things that tip, in typical orthopedics, we would do stretching, bracing, and oral anti-inflammatories. So this is what we're looking at here. Uh, on the image here, you see uh, Dr. Pappas actually doing an ultrasound guided injection. And these are, they call them cock up wrist splints are typically some of the first uh, line of a therapy for carpal tunnel. Mm -hmm. Cortisone injections have been done. Uh, hand surgeons will do a lot of these in the hand, hand surgery clinics that I was in. Uh, you just do it by palpation guidance and you're just going to inject into that carpal tunnel. And sometimes, uh, you know, a blind squirrel finds the nuts and it does well. But at the end of the day, the pros, uh, it can be alleviating anti-inflammatory effect, but it can also uh, elevate blood sugar, can weaken the tissues and cause uh, in increased risk for os osteoporosis, et cetera. Platelet-rich plasma is something that we do and that we've found some platelet-rich plasma or platelet lysate. There are multiple studies now that show that there are some really good benefits from ultrasound guided injections for carpal tunnel. And this study itself, it's a level two study with nine uh, randomized control trials, uh, randomized control trials in it with 434 patients showed that PRP in mild to moderate carpal tunnel syndrome versus cortisone, saline, and splinting, um, there was a significant improvement um, in the group at three to six months. So all promising. Uh, the next study he talks about is a level one study. So level one, level two. Uh, level one is better than level two. So this is uh, 52 uh, patients. So PRP versus saline with advanced carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a significant improvement in pain and scale across sectional uh, area of the median nerve, which is what we showed how you can diagnose it with ultrasound. And then there's surgical treatments, and I've seen many of these surgical treatments. Uh, hand surgeons line these up for days. They have about 10 or 15 in clinics, but why open the wrist if you don't have to open the wrist? And this is where I'm going to leave it off for Dr. Pappas to talk a little bit more about a novel device that is not affiliated with Regenix. want to be super clear about that, that this is a non-Regenix procedure that we offer that's uh, unique to our clinic, and Dr. Pappas will talk about it. Yeah, so the the issue with carpal tunnel, as we said, is, you know, we don't want to leave it too late for the person to get permanent weakness. Um, go back to the last slide. This is actually just a, a study that came out in the British Medical Journal that looked at 10 of the most common orthopedic surgeries and 
it really assessed whether or not there's good evidence uh, to do these versus a placebo or versus conservative care. Um, and these are these are very commonly performed orthopedic procedures. I mean, including things like meniscus surgeries, ACL surgeries, shoulder surgeries, back surgeries, et cetera. And the only one of these that has definitive um, good evidence to do in place of conservative care or a placebo is the carpal tunnel surgery. And that's because in general, people will get, uh, can avoid that permanent weakness with the carpal tunnel surgery long-term versus doing, doing nothing or conservative care. Um, next slide. So what is the goal of the carpal tunnel surgery? It is to basically make uh, a small incision in the ligament that creates the roof of the carpal tunnel. Um, by opening up that ligament, you basically give that nerve more room uh, so that it's not compressed, it's not causing those symptoms, uh, and then it has room to heal from whatever damage has been done to it. Uh, next slide. So the typical mini open carpal tunnel release, this is the one that's done in the hospital or the surgery center by uh, by the hand surgeon, uh, is where you basically cut into the wrist, cut that ligament, and sew everything back up. Um, uh, the standard recovery time for this is somewhere between three to six months, which is a long time when you consider people are, you know, not really able to use their hand to great effect uh, during that time. Next uh, slide. And so what, what we do here is uh, a procedure using a, a device um, from a company called Sonex that allows us to basically cut that ligament in a way that uh, reduces uh, the invasiveness of the procedure in order to basically get the same result with much less recovery time. So with this device, what we're able to do is just have the patient uh, awake in our office and use a little bit of local anesthetic and then uh, numb them up, put this device in, make a small cut, and then uh, it's all done. So go to the next slide for me, Dr. Torrance. Um, the incision that we make is about four to five millimeters. It's small enough where we don't even need to suture it afterwards. Um, and with the device, the idea is to basically only cut that ligament and, and not have to cut through skin, through subcutaneous tissue or anything else um, so that the patient recovers quickly. Next slide. So if we play this, um, it'll show a little, uh, little graphic of basically what happens during the procedure. Um, Play it. So cannot play it. media. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, but basically what happens is we scan uh, the wrist. We look at the uh, different uh, structures where we want to be. And then we uh, uh, numb things up, insert the device, and we're able to see under ultrasound the uh, that ligament that we'd like to cut. We um, inflate some balloons, which pushes things out of the way and creates a safe um, barrier against anything else that we don't want to cut, like a nerve or a vessel. And then uh, once we're in perfect position, we can just engage the blade on the device, uh, cut it, and then uh, take the device out and put some bandages on and then see the patient back in a week. Next slide. So this is a good slide because the patient, this is the same patient and on the right wrist, uh, they had the mini open surgery six weeks prior to this. And on the left wrist, they were three days after uh, using the Sonics device in the less invasive way. Um, and you can see the difference in terms of invasiveness. So in one, you have to cut through a lot uh, and then it takes a long time to recover. On the other, uh, uh, obviously it looks like, you know, you heal much quicker and your patients have a return of functionality on average much, much quicker than they do with the typical surgery. Just being clear, I want to make sure that everybody here is uh, understanding this. This was the surgical intervention uh, that we do not offer. That's where surgeons do it. And this is the intervention that we offer with the Sonics micro knife, which has a much, much smaller incision. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I would prefer the smaller one if it was my wrist. So I'm just going to throw out there. Um, and so what do the studies say? Well, we we. Uh, there's been a couple of studies that have, have been conducted to follow patients who get uh, the typical surgery versus patients who get the one with the Sonics device. What they find basically is that people get better five times faster when you do the less invasive surgery 
which makes sense. They also have to use less pain medicine. They get back, they get relief of their symptoms much, much quicker as well uh, in the study that we pulled up here. Uh, the next slide, this is just another study that basically looked at the long-term outcomes between the two, and they found at two years, the uh, uh, benefits for each of the surgeries were equivalent to a little better in the in the micro group. But basically, what we're doing is we're cutting down on the uh, time it takes for the patient to recover. So uh, normally, three to six month recovery with a mini open a carpal tunnel release surgery, whereas with the, the less invasive one, it's more like three to six days. Next. Uh, so what to expect with this, with, with the uh, Sonics procedure, basically, you're going to be in clinic for about an hour, perhaps. Uh, local anesthesia, if someone wants to take a Xanax beforehand to make it go quicker, that's fine. Um, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes once we get started, no sutures. And then typically, I tell patients, you know, avoid lifting more than 10 pounds for about a week. I see them back a week later, make sure everything looks good, and they're good to go. Um, Post-procedure physical therapy, I've never had to order for this procedure because there's not enough scar tissue to really uh, make a big difference. Uh, these are all patients that have had the procedure three to six days afterwards. So um, this is what people can expect in terms of uh, a post-procedure uh, wound or, or, or scar, and then over time, this fades quite a bit. And we, we got uh, five minutes to take some questions from anybody. Uh, if you want to follow us or uh, you want to come in for an evaluation, um, give us that. Uh, give us a call on that number or go to newregenerorthro.com and uh, fill out the candidate form. Um, Dr. Pappas, I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. Would you have something else to say? No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that anyone has about carpal tunnel syndrome or any procedure or dealing with it. Uh, type them in the Q&A or the chat box. There's a question about prolo versus PRP versus PLM. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Sure. Um, so prolo therapy uh, is basically uh, an irritant uh, that increases the body's own growth factors in the area. There, there have been, um, I think, I think it's probably an okay solution uh, in terms of carpal tunnel. The thing with prolo therapy is typically it takes a number of repeat treatments in order to get the same effect that PRP or platelet lysate treats. Um, no, Dr. Torrance and I, um, we typically prefer platelet lysate just because it's less uh, inflammatory around the nerves uh, than PRP, but um, both are, are valid options. I think especially in the case, in my practice, especially if the patient has like mild to moderate carpal tunnel syndrome, or if they've had carpal tunnel syndrome for six months or less, you know, PRP, I think PRP or P platelet lysate is a great option. If they've had it for 10 years and, you know, it's been getting worse and then, then it's more like we're talking about um, more the uh, more the surgical approach or the uh, the microinvasive surgery. Awesome. I'll take the next question. Um, does triscaphe arthritis cause a uh, problem for the procedure? Uh, no, I would just tell you that we need to also do a PRP injection into uh, the arthritis. Uh, PRP does fantastic. Our concentrated PRP that Regenix can bring uh, would do a fantastic job there. Um, and then also we would do the hydrodissection with the PLM concurrently to try to get you the best results. Again, depending on how severe your carpal tunnel is, is is the, you know, and, and the predisposing factors are arthritis. So if we can calm down some of the inflammation that's causing some decreased space in that wrist, uh, a lot of times my, my my philosophy is to try to get that calmed down first and then see how the carpal tunnel proceeds from there. Um, yeah, abs absolutely. Um, and so the next uh, next patient is asking how to distinguish carpal versus cu uh, cubital tunnel or combined symptoms. Yeah, so uh, it, it depends on the situation, but if somebody has carpal and uh, cubital tunnel uh, symptoms, it probably would ultrasound both the cubital tunnel and the carpal tunnel. Um, and then potentially, you know, the question is, do, is this also coming from the neck? You know, mm -hmm. so at a certain point, we would want to evaluate you and see if it, an MRI of the neck might be warranted before we did any kind of procedure, because, uh, you know, chances are you may need uh, a neck procedure and not necessarily a, uh, a cubital or carpal tunnel procedure. Yep. Uh, the next question is, uh, is my patient, so I'll, I'll field it. Uh, do you ever recommend uh, stem cell injections? Uh, Yes, I do. We do recommend stem cell injections for certain conditions. I know I don't think you're talking about the wrist here. That's why I wanted to field this question. 
Uh, we do. If if you get if you get only moderate mild to moderate relief with PRP, uh, it, when it, it comes to arthritic conditions, um, I, I believe you're speaking about your back. Um, you know, if if you do have some facetogenic arthritis or if it's ridiculous symptoms, uh, I wouldn't do ridiculous symptoms here. I'd probably do that in Cayman, but we do recommend stem cell injections uh, for the right case for the right issues. And it has to be, you know, uh, we'd have to have a follow up uh, or uh, the patient that is on here. We'd have to have a follow up and we can talk about that. But uh, get on my schedule. Happy to see it. Um, do you want to talk about the next one, Dr. Pabas? Sure. So how long have we been offering this procedure? I believe we started in 2020. Uh, so I think it's been about three and a half years. Uh, how many patients have we treated? Um, I believe I've treated over. I, it, this is uh, this is just um, specifically referring to the Sonics uh, procedure. Uh, with that one, I've treated over 50. And what do the outcomes look like? Excellent. Uh, very, you know, almost always patient comes back a week later. They're telling me that their symptoms have greatly improved and that they continue to improve. Uh, it's easy. It's nice because patients could get uh, better much quicker and we can keep them from having the more invasive type of procedure. Yep. Any other questions? I know Dr. Pappas and I have to run back to patient care, but uh, we just wanted to make sure that we got on here and got some uh, questions from any of our patients out there. Please feel free to jump on uh, New Regen Ortho or give us a call at 941-226-8856 uh, to schedule an appointment to come see either uh, myself, Dr. Velastro, Dr. Pappas, or Dr. Lieber uh, in one of our locations. Um, if I have arthritis only in my hands, no carpal tunnel, PRP is a viable option. Yes, Greg, uh, uh, that that we I typically like to start with PRP first. I don't know Dr. Pappas' uh, practice, but our concentrated platelets do really, really well for um, for arthritis in the hand. Uh, it depends on exactly where. Uh, that would be why an evaluation would be necessary to come in. Let's determine exactly if it's CMC arthritis, if it's triscaphy arthritis, is it radiocarpal arthritis? I mean, like, where, where are we talking about? And we go from there. Dr. Pappas, you yeah, yeah, I agree. I, we do um, much more much more PRP for wrist, uh, thumb, uh, et cetera, ar arthritis um, than we do uh, stem cells, although we do do stem cells for in some cases of those. But yeah, PRP most of the time um, gets, gets the result that we want. All right. Well, listen, thank you for your time. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful Thursday. Hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. We've got a new baby at home and uh, I'm, I'm asking tips from Dr. Pappas all the time because uh, I don't know he does it with three. So uh, I've got two, he's got three uh, and uh, we're a happy family. <laughs> have, a, <laughs> right. have a great day, everybody. Take it easy.